Hey, Venture. It's great to see you today. I'm glad you joined us for our online worship service today. I want to tell you a tree tale. It's a tale of two trees. It's actually a story of epic proportions because, well, much of the eastern United States has been affected by the preamble to this story. My part of the story began last spring in 2020 during the height of the lockdown portion of the pandemic. It continued this spring, 2021, and this story probably won't see any results or fruit until at least five years from now. But this story actually had its beginning about 100 years ago. Are you confused yet? Hang on. Here we go. Once upon a time in a land not too far from here, well, right here, actually. 100 years ago, the eastern hardwood forest here in the U.S. looked a lot different than it does today. Perhaps you remember the Christmas song, chestnuts roasting on an open fire, Jack Frost knit. I'll, share you my, I'll spare you my singing, especially of a Christmas song in, in June. Have you ever wondered what a chestnut is from that song? Or where you could find a chestnut tree for that matter? Well, you used to find them in abundance right here. Before a disease, I, I think they call it a blight, pretty much completely wiped them out in the very early 1900s. Listen, if you could custom design the ideal tree species, you couldn't come up with a better one than the American chestnut. It was a huge, majestic tree with very straight stem and, and, and trunks. As one author who was celebrating the chestnut tree years ago wrote, he said, speaking of this in the early days of America, quote, not only was the baby's crib likely made of chestnut, but chances were, so was the old man's coffin. One of its good qualities was a high durability. The heartwood of the lumber from these trees could be used in situations where decay was going to be a problem. And the tree was common. It made up about 50% of most eastern hardwood forests. Did you catch that? They say 50% of our trees here used to be chestnuts. And it had fruit. The chestnuts were edible, not only by wildlife, but also by humans. I already sang you the song, I'll spare you that again. It was an important food source for all. The same author I mentioned just a bit ago also said, quote, the farmer's hogs were fattened on chestnuts and to no small degree, his children were also. Chestnut was also prized as a landscape tree. It was pretty to look at. The problem is they were a prized tree. Now they're all but gone. Skip ahead now in the story. To last spring, my wife's grandmother passed away right at the beginning of the lockdown portion of the COVID-19 pandemic. Her last name was, get this, Chestnut. Dawn's family has a history of commemorating important moments by planting a tree. Ask me sometime to tell you about the mica tree that Dawn's other grandmother planted in our backyard when our firstborn was born. And then we transplanted uh, that same tree to Grandma, uh, to, to, to Dawn's folks home when, when we moved away from that area. Well, when Grandma Jean Chestnut Woods passed away, I wanted to plant a chestnut tree. Two, actually. And I discovered that you have to plant at least two of them for them to propagate and produce chestnuts. So I searched high and low and I found a nursery that had produced a hybrid chestnut tree. They plant and they grow them in Florida and they ship them up here. And then I drove all over central Illinois during that lockdown period last year just to find a couple of them. Remember, I said it was a tale of two trees. I planted them in my backyard. I spent the whole summer last summer tending them. One of them died. I suspect I broke one of the cardinal rules of tree planting. We're going to talk about that here in just a moment. But skip ahead a year to the spring of 2021 this year. I repeated the process again this year. I kept calling and bugging the nursery for their shipment dates. And I drove down and around all over central Indiana and I found one of those trees in Bloomington and I hauled it up here inside of our minivan. I discovered in the process that Dawn might be deathly allergic to the chestnut pollen in the process. That's another story for another time. And this summer, I'm playing farmer to two beautiful juvenile chestnut trees in our backyard. I think there are spiritual lessons to harvest from this nature story, starting with this one. I am planting now for a harvest I hope to enjoy five to seven years from now. 
it would probably take that long for those trees to produce any fruit. I'm playing the long game on this. This is a great way to think about the topic that we're studying today. Jesus had a lot to say about long-term horticultural investment in Luke chapter 6, what we know of as the Sermon on the Plain. If you've been tracking along on this summer sermon series, we're calling it Mountains and Valleys because we recognize that life is filled with mountaintop experiences. Rocky Mountain High, Colorado, right? It's also filled with the valley below kind of experiences. We're digging out of a global pandemic right now. We've all seen some of the depths of despair. Well, this series is an attempt to get us back to living a level life. If you've been tracking along, you've heard me say a few times now as we study through the Sermon on the Mount when we're inside during our summer series and as we study through the Sermon on the Plain when we're outside here for our worship on the lawn weekends. By the way, we have one more of those planned. We have one going on today. That's why I'm preaching outside. And today there's a whole bunch of people out here enjoying God's creation. We're worshiping together outside on our second worship of the lawn on the summer. But we have one more planned. Make plans to be here and join us in person outside here on our south lawn Sunday, July 25th at 10 a.m. Anyway, as I've been saying as we read through these two sermons found here in our New Testament Bibles, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6, we're tempted to think of them as two different sermons. But I believe it's the same sermon. Luke simply remembers it as sitting on a level plain, and Matthew remembers it as sitting on a mountainside. But if you weren't here the first week of this series, go back and watch that. I showed you some photos of a location right next to the Sea of Galilee that is both a mountain and a level plain. Same sermon preached from the same location, but remembered with different descriptors. Why? Because oftentimes it's simply a matter of perspective. As we seek to level out the mountains and the valleys in our lives this summer, let's seek to getting back to living a level life. This passage today from Luke chapter 6 has some huge insights for you and I to do. Just that. Let's dive in together, shall we? Jesus has a tale of two trees here for us as well. Let's read together in Luke chapter 6. In my Bible, in verse 43, it's titled, A Tree and Its Fruit. And it says this, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear Good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Would you bow your head right now and could we pray together? Father, as we unpack your words, Jesus, you spoke these words on a mountainside and on a level plain 2,000 years ago. They had truth that rang in the ears of your original audience, and I believe that they have truth that should ring in our ears today. Would you simply speak to our hearts, speak to our minds right now? We seek to listen. Amen. Okay, can I state the obvious? In this part of the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus is talking about trees but he's really not. He's talking about you. And just so we don't miss the obvious, you're the tree in this story. So am I. So several observations and challenges for you, the tree. For the rest of our time together today, I wanna to share with you three true statements about fruit, three quick planting instructions, and then one simple challenge. So first, three true statements about fruit. Here's the first. All trees should bear fruit. We pull this straight out of the text, Luke chapter 6, verse 43 and 44. Remember, he said, each tree, each tree is recognized by its own fruit. They should bear fruit, but they don't always. Sometimes an early frost zaps the crop. Sometimes lack of care is the problem. Sometimes they don't get pruned correctly. Here's what all of this means for you and for me. 
Just as a full and lush tree does not necessarily produce the best fruit, so also a person who looks flowery and behaves like they're spiritually rich may in fact be the worst trees to gather fruit from. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, Christ warns certain Christians who are rich and wealthy that though they appear to have it all together, they really are poor and destitute. It's not how you appear or how you act or how you dress that matters. What matters is your heart. And this is revealed by the fruit you produce. And you know those weeds and bugs in your life that test your patience. That lack of money, that sickness, that global pandemic, that stressful situation at work, that difficult neighbor, God, the orchard expert put those there for a reason. They strengthen you. They keep the bad bugs of sin out of your core. They use up the bad nutrients of the ground where you're planted and they leave better ones behind like love and patience and joy and long suffering. Those times of dryness and times of barren winter are also for your benefit. When it seems like you could use a good spiritual fertilizer or a good watering, God knows what you need to produce the best fruit. He sends people to water your life and he calls you to a regimented schedule of daily waterings through his word so that you can produce the best fruit. And then there's the pruning. God only wants the best fruit to proceed from you. And sacrificing some of the early fruit will encourage the remainder to grow big and sweet. Remember, many trees, including my new chestnut trees, take five to seven years before they begin producing a good crop of fruit. And that's only if they've been well tended. This is why it's always good advice for new and young Christians to grow where they're planted to speak little and to learn much, to get daily watering through the Word of God, to to prune their words so that only the best will come out of their mouths. God is in the fruit producing business and you and I are His trees. He wants good fruit, so He goes to great lengths to make good trees. He factors in the age and the soil type and the sun exposure and the temperature He waters, He prunes and fertilizes as needed. When Christians become good trees, they naturally begin to produce good fruit. This is the truth of Luke chapter 6, verse 43. And Luke chapter 6, verse 44 contains another truth about fruit production. Here's number two, all people bear fruit. Remember verse 45? The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Jesus teaches that everybody produces some kind of fruit. Good fruit comes from those with good hearts and evil is produced from those with evil in their hearts. Galatians chapter five challenges us to live by the direction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then Paul, the author says, the fruit or the evidence of this is tasty. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All people bear fruit. When our world looks at you, what kind of fruit do they see? Think about that right now. Did your coworkers, maybe your boss, the cashier at the grocery store this past week, did they see evidence of God's Holy Spirit at work in your life during their day-to-day interactions with you? Was there good fruit on display in your life? If not, what do you plan to do about that this coming week? Remember, all people bear fruit. Does the world see Jesus in and through what you're producing? This brings us to the third true statement about fruit. Your words are the fruit. Remember the passage, Luke chapter 6, verse 45, For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Have you ever listened to what comes out of your mouth? The words when you pray. The words when you talk. The words when you speak or text on the phone. Just listen to yourself sometime. When you talk to others, do you always try to turn the conversation, for example, back to yourself? Someone tells a story about their trip to Minnesota and that reminds you of a story about your trip to Maine because they both start with M and then you just have to tell. I might have done that exact thing just a couple of days ago. That's why it's fresh on my mind. A person with a proud heart always tries to turn the conversation back to themselves. Listen to what you say, and you may find yourself doing this. 
when you're about to turn the conversation to a story about yourself, stop and ask yourself, do I really need to tell this story? Do I really need to make this statement? Why don't I, instead of sharing my story, ask the other person to share more about theirs? That always shows an interest in them rather than a proud interest in only yourself. Or how about this one? When you talk to others, does your conversation turn to talking negatively about other people? Maybe about leaders and those in authority? That reveals a heart filled with gossip and slander, maybe even hate. When you talk to others, do you complain and groan about all of your problems and struggles? Do you talk only of the things you can't have and the things you wish you could buy? Do you talk about how others have nicer houses and newer cars and brand new clothes? Such words reveal a heart that lacks contentment. When you talk to others, do you only talk about earthly things such as your job and your recreational activities, maybe the local news, without ever turning to, to spiritual matters? Well, these words reveal a heart fixed only on earthly things. Or how about this, when you talk to others, do you talk down to them and make biting remarks to them? Sometimes this is not so much the words themselves, but maybe even the tone of those words. Such belittling words reveal a heart full of anger and resentment. When you talk to others, does foul language and crass comments or maybe off-color jokes ever escape your lips? Well, that reveals a heart full of impurity and lust. When you talk to others, is it only about the next toy you want to buy or the next vacation you want to go on? Well, that reveals a heart full of greed. You get the idea? Listen to your topics of conversation during the day. Do your words ever turn to speaking about God or the Bible or spiritual matters? Or do you only stick to the weather, the sports, current events? You don't need to talk about God and the Bible all the time, but if God and the Word of God never enter your speech, it is certain that they don't hold a prominent place in your heart either. Always, our speech betrays us. Well, those are three true statements about fruit. Now I want to share with you three quick planting instructions. The first one comes out of the context of this passage. Here it is. Plant now. These trees that Jesus referenced had been planted, right? How else could they bear fruit? Listen, there's no time like the present to take action steps to grow your spiritual life. There's an old Chinese proverb that I think about sometimes, and I think it's kind of profound when we think about trees. It says this, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is today. Let me ask you this important question. Are you rooted in healthy Christian community right now? I, I really believe this. Post-pandemic, this getting back to church is essential for spiritual growth. I, I spent a fair amount of time this past week thinking about a passage in the Old Testament. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. And I was reminded just this past week that healthy Christian community is so beneficial and it's wise for me to plant roots down deeper and there's no time like the present to do that. Here's the story, my, my son Eric, he's my oldest, he needed to buy a car. He was that kid that got a job when he was 14 years old. He, he just finished up his sophomore year of college and he's been saving for a long time. He needed a, a dependable car to get him back and forth to college in Kokomo. Well, we started hitting used car lots and he learned a pretty important life lesson. Sometimes used car salesmen will even lie to you to sell their car. Well, in the middle of those disappointing lessons, about the same time, I put the word out on social media that he needed a car. One of our neighbors and friends reached out. He's a good man. We served as pastors at another area church together for a bunch of years. Here's the cool thing. He was Eric's small group leader for most of his middle school and high school years. Seriously, my friend Todd Holsworth was in my house almost every Wednesday night since Eric was in seventh grade, pouring into Eric, growing his faith, planting good seeds, watering those seeds of faith. Well, Todd reached out and said, I have a car I'm selling and I wanna make Eric a great deal. And boy, did he. Can I be honest? 
It's been a tough couple of years for our college kids. This pandemic has been weird and it's been, it's been rough on everyone. I personally hate what it's done to my boys through this super important growing season of their lives as they're starting college. I believe that God used my friend Todd to smile on Eric with a blessing in the form of a used car. And I couldn't help but smile as Eric and I contrasted the tough time we were having finding him a car with what happened as soon as one of God's family stepped in and helped him right then and there. There's no time like the present to plant. Plant now. To begin to experience the good things that God provides his kids right now. Which leads me to the second planting instruction. Plant wisely. If you're the tree, and I believe you are in this, in this story of Jesus from the greatest sermon ever preached, as you plant your seeds of faith, choose your growth areas wisely. A seed is anything valuable that you give away. When you give away praise, there's value to that. When you give away good advice, there's value to that. When you give away your time, there's value to that. When you give away your money, there's value to that. When you share your experience to help other people, there's value to that. When you give your love away, there's great value to that. And it all starts as a seed. Whether it's your time, whether it's your money, appreciation, wisdom, or energy, your words could also be seeds that you plant in people's minds. They grow and they bear fruit there. So you need to choose your words wisely especially when you're talking with people that you love, like your children or your husband or your wife and your friends. Let me ask you this. What kinds of seeds are you planting in your relationships? Are you planting seeds of trust or are you planting seeds of distrust? Are you planting seeds of kindness or are you planting seeds of crankiness? Are you planting seeds that build up or are you planting seeds that tear down? Remember, you will reap whatever you sow. Here's the last planting instruction today. Plant where the soil is fertile and then weed when you have time. Jesus tells a story in Matthew chapter 13 called the parable of the seeds and the sower. Basically, he talks about different soil conditions. The farmer casts seed, and some falls on rocky soil, some falls on hard-packed soil, some falls in with the weeds, and some falls in good, amended soil. I've hiked around the Judean hill country, where Jesus was standing when he was telling that particular parable. You might be thinking, why would a farmer cast his seeds in where there are rocks? It was kind of genius in that day and time, actually. The rocks acted like little fertilizer systems. The morning dew would collect on them and then run down the sides of the rock and get this, water the seeds. The problem is though, too much of a good thing can become a bad thing. I love how in this parable, Jesus actually explains to his audience what the story means. In Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 18, this is what Jesus says. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path, that hard-packed soil. The one who receives the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lacks he lasts only for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that was, uh, fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Plant where the soil is fertile. And as you have time, pull some of those weeds of sin that are growing around your heart, threatening to choke out the good seeds that God is planting there. Because we want to grow good things for Him. This is what we're aiming at, friends. We want to produce good fruit, much fruit for our God. So plant where the soil is fertile and weed when you have time. Plant wisely. 
Plant now, don't wait. All trees should bear fruit, all people bear fruit, and your words are the fruit. May the world we interact with this week see Jesus in all that we do and all that we say. May we weed out the rot that, like that chestnut blight we spoke of earlier, seeks to destroy the fruit-producing potential that our Creator has designed us to be. We bear much fruit. Let it be fruit that will last. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to simply stand out in your gorgeous creation, listen to the birds chirp, and to read this passage, and as I do that, I can't help but think that it was probably similar conditions when you spoke this sermon on a hillside, on a level place, a sermon on the mount, a sermon on the plain about 2,000 years ago. Lord, I know that this, these were powerful words for people who were seeking to live their lives following hard after you then. And I pray that it's important and that we receive it as important today. And that it informs our world, our life, as we seek to live that life for you this week. As we seek to worship out loud with our actions. May you be honored by the fruit that we produce as an act of worship for you, our Creator. This week. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.